Hello and welcome to video 4, 2402 lecture, respiratory system. Uh, okay, so now we're still talking about physiology here. And uh, first I'd like to talk about what exactly uh, affects how easy it is for you to get air in and out of your lungs. So factors affecting pulmonary ventilation sounds confusing, but it just says what, what's, what do you have to get over to get air in and out? Uh, first way, firstly, remember this formula, right? F equals delta P over R, and that's the same formula for blood flow as you'd use for uh, airflow. Um, in the case of airflow, R is so small because air is such a a, a fluid uh, fluid. It's a, I mean, a, it is a fluid. Um, it's such an easy thing to push back and forth. There's not, not very little viscosity. So unless you've got some respiratory disorder uh, and the tubes are fine, then resistance is not going to be that big of a deal. So then really how well you can get air in and out is due to the change in pressure. So if I want to get air in and out slowly, I can just make a, a very gentle pressure gradient. And that's what you do normally when you breathe. So if I'm going to breathe normally, I don't know if you can hear that, but a normal breath, air doesn't move out very fast. If I want to get air in and out fast, you change the, the amount of pressure you're generating and you're going to get that air coming out. <clears throat> Another factor is alveolar surface tension. So as I mentioned, the lungs want to pull back and there is a, uh, your, the lungs are lined, the inside of your lungs are lined with a liquid, right? Um, they kept moist so that air, so that gases can go across. But that liquid, mostly water, tends to attract to itself. And that's going to kind of make those alveoli want to shrink. So uh, as you're, that, that gives you the benefit of having the, uh, the, the um, intrapleural pressure be less than the intrapulmonary pressure, but it also says that you're going to have to work to expand those lungs a little bit. It's not too hard. Um, we produce a lot of surfactant. If you want to make more surfactant, take a couple of really deep breaths. If you take super deep breath, <sighs> And hold it for a second and then breathe it out. And you do that a couple times, you're actually going to find it easier to breathe after that for a while, right? So if you're going to go for a run, take some super deep breaths first. Uh, babies that are born too prematurely don't produce surfactant, which means they want, they need to be on a breather because their lungs will just, they're too, they're too, uh, they're too uh, tight. And lastly, lung compliance, which is kind of a general term, but how, how flexible your lung tissue is. Alveolar surface tension plays a little bit of this, and uh, thoracic cage plays a little bit of this, but mostly it's how stretchy your lung tissue is. So if you're young and healthy, relatively, you're probably going to have real flexible lungs, and it's not hard to breathe. Um, injuries or uh, infection or um, uh, particulate matter accumulating in your lungs can affect that lung compliance and make it harder to breathe. So people that you know, smoke or working coal mines or, you know, are exposed to a lot of air, aerial atmospheric pollution may, as they get older, have a more and more difficult time breathing. Next slide. Um, this is a pretty common graph over here, and you'll see it in lab. Uh, and these are what are called respiratory volumes and capacities. Volumes are simple, single measurements, and capacities are, are, are sums, right? So you can see the inspiratory reserve volume and the tidal volume together make the inspiratory capacity. So here's this right here. Know the names and descriptions. I don't want you to know the volumes. You're going to have to know those in lab. So you might as well learn them, but I'm not going to ask you in lecture. But I will have you know that the, the amount of air left in your lungs after you breathe all the way out is called your residual volume. And here's how you walk through that. Tidal volume is just normal breathing, right? So it would be like... Let me breathe like that. If you want to take a big breath, you're going to go into your inspiratory reserve volume. At the very deepest breath you can take, if you blew that all the way out till you couldn't blow it out anymore, you've got inspiratory reserve volume plus vital tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume. Those three add up to the vital capacity. So when I said, what's the name of the... Uh, amount of air left in your lungs after you breathe it all the way after you breathe all the way out it's the residual volume even though if you look up residual volume oh eh, well it doesn't say it exactly that way right 
amount of air remaining in the lungs after a forced expiration. That's how it's written in this textbook. The way a normal person would say it to another person is, the residual volume is what's left after you've exhaled all the air you can. So there's the kind of thing you need to understand. Don't necessarily memorize these words, right? They're good, but you have to understand what they mean. Be able to translate them into a commonly used way to describe it. Uh, so yeah, know these. <clears throat> and there's their descriptions right there. Uh, dead space. You're not going to use all the space in your lungs. Matter of fact, the entire conducting zone is dead space. Uh, my, there's air in my trachea when I take as deep a breath as possible. Deepest breath possible, there's still air in my trachea which will never get to the respiratory zone. So there's some kind of, you know, well, it's dead space. The other, that's called, uh, sorry, anatomical dead space, the stuff in the conducting zone. This, if you've got blocked up alveoli, mucus or something, or collapsed, then the, the alveolar dead space um, comes into play. And when you add them the two up, then you've got the sum of the two. You've got total dead space. At uh, rest, you're normally going to breathe in about six liters per minute. And if you go for a vigorous exercise, you can get up to about 200 liters of air per minute. So you, the amount of air you get in and out is going to go up dramatically with exercise. The last slide for this uh, screencast it deals with some more of these kind of laws and now we're switching gears here right up here it was how do I get air moving in and out of my lungs and now down here it's partial pressures of gases in a mixture hmm all right two of them named after the people who first described them there's Dalton's law of partial pressures which says the total pressure of a mixture in the sum is the sum of the partial pressures of the gases so if you've got, looking down here at this table, uh, if there's 78.6% nitrogen, 20.9% oxygen, 0.04% CO2, and 0.46% uh, H2O water vapor, that as you breathe those in, they're going to move across the membrane. I'm looking at Henry's by now, but they're going to be, uh, they're going to apply pressure to the walls of those of your lungs in proportion to how to their uh, to how much there is in in the mixture so you're gonna have more pressure exerted on the walls of your alveoli by nitrogen than oxygen more by oxygen than co2 and so on now Henry's law states that because of those different pressures gases will dissolve into a liquid in proportion to their partial pressure so they exert pressure that's in proportion to their um, how, how much of each one there is and they'll dissolve in proportion to how much of each one there is now this all else being equal if some sometimes gases have different uh, solubilities but we're not going to take any of that into consideration be aware that if you're breathing air that's got 50 percent oxygen you're going to get a lot more oxygen into your blood than if you're breathing air that's got 21 percent oxygen that's kind of how that works uh, if you go to the dentist's office though, and they give you nitrous oxide, they're going to give you a mix of nitrous oxide and, and oxygen. And it'll usually be around 50-50. If they notch that up to 60% nitrous oxide and 40% oxygen, you're going to be getting more nitrous than you will oxygen, vice versa. Oh, and then this right here kind of shows you what happens when you breathe. So in the atmosphere, look at these percentages. In my alveoli, look at these percentages. So you'll notice that nitrogen doesn't change a whole lot, a, a couple of percentage points. But when you have 75% or whatever, it's not that big of a change relatively. Oxygen drops off considerably, right? So this shows that you've absorbed a lot of oxygen from the atmosphere. CO2 goes up considerably, which shows you that you're releasing a lot of CO2 into the alveoli from your blood. And water vapor, of course, goes up because it's very wet down there. That is it for this fourth video.